You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you? How are you all? See, I've already failed and we're sort of, I don't know, two seconds in. Are you okay? Are you doing better than me? I am actually fine. Although yesterday I was running, well, I'd gone for a walk with the kids and for some reason I started running. I don't know why. I, it was to try and demonstrate to them that I'm quite proficient at running, which I'm not. I'm more proficient at eating chocolate and then I have to do the running anyway. So I was demonstrating my running to them and my son told me that I run like a T-Rex and my daughter agreed and said it was particularly the way I hold my hands. So I, I don't know what vision that leaves with you, but I don't think it's a particularly good one. And I am mortally offended, but never mind. So there we go. Uh, I better stick to books, I think, than trying to run. It just doesn't work very well. But what does work very well is the special I have for you this week. My goodness, I have de dedicated some time to this and I don't know why. I don't know what point this serves, but anyway, let's go with it. So every year, the Bookseller Magazine, which is um, a, a UK uh, publication, comes out normally every Friday. Uh, every year they hold the, um, the uh, a competition for the best YA, young adult, book. And they come out with a short list um, around about March time. And then they announce the winner usually, usually it's sort of end of May, early June at the Hay Festival. But of course, uh, this year, as with last year, they can't announce it at the Hay Festival, sadly, but they'll still announce it. So at the time of recording this, I know what the 10 books are, but I don't know who's won or, or any of that. Um, but I have, for for your delight and delectation, I have read all 10 of them. I, I am, yes, unable to speak properly, as, as you can tell, um, probably because I've just... <laughs> I've just read so many books. When I finished the last one, I thought, oh, I actually don't want to have to read another book for a while. And then half an hour later, I thought, oh, do you know what I fancy? A good book. Um, what I would say about the 10 is that in some ways there is a huge variety. Um, they're all fiction. And as I say, they're all YA, obviously, getting the award for the YA book of the year. Um, but, but... In some ways, some of them were quite similar. And I don't necessarily want to say, well, this was identical with this one because it could actually give some of the plot away. Um, but, for example, there was no sci-fi book. There was there's one his one really historical one. Well, I suppose one done in the 1930s. Um, but th th there wasn't. There was a range, but not a depth of different books, if that makes sense. So that was quite interesting. One book was about 200 pages long, which I loved when I thought, how am I going to get all these 10 read? Um, but anyway, let me tell you the names. Um, and then we're actually I'm going to go tell you a bit about each book and I'm going to tell you my top five. And I'm going to tell you them in order. Da, da, da. So come out with my best one. And I honestly haven't recorded this knowing who the winner is. So if by some miracle I manage to choose the same book, I won't. But anyway, who it is without knowledge of who's won. And as well, I then have the most fascinating, hopefully um, for you, uh, interview with um, Faber. Now, just to give a bit of background on this, the Faber Academy um, was set up some time ago to uh, help people write books. And it was particularly courses in London. Um, and of course, now it's online as well. And the reason why I wanted to talk to them, well, we've spoken to a few different people, haven't we? We've talked to publishers, editors, um, agents, and of course, lots and lots of authors. And whenever an author has mentioned doing a course, and quite a few of them have, Without exception, except what, there was just one mention of a Curtis Brown course, but all the others said they'd done the Faber course and it had worked so well. So I thought, well, what is this magic in a Faber course? Um, and I thought, well, let's talk to them. Let's find out about it. So we're going to do the 10 YA books and then we're going to talk to Faber. So there's quite a lot to pack into this episode, um, but I'll just get started and, and then we'll we'll see how we go. So... 
the books we've got um, for the 10YA are Loveless by Alice Osman, Melt My Heart by Bethany Rutter, uh, Wranglestone by Darren Charlton, Eight Pieces of Silver by Patrice Lawrence, The Great Godden by Meg Rosoff, A Snowfall of Silver by Laura Wood, uh, Hold Back the Tide by Melinda Salisbury, and The Stars Were Burning Brightly by Danielle Yawando. Um, Good Girl, Bad Blood by Holly Jackson. And finally, Cain Warriors by Alex Wheatle. Um, yeah, I, there, are, there, are, there are quite a selection there, aren't there? But as I say, I just I thought there'd be even more of a selection. But let's get started. So The Great Garden is not in my top five, um, but I still really enjoyed it. It's it's a beautiful book as well, but this is the blurb. This is the story of one family, one dreamy summer, the summer where everything changes. In a sun-drenched house by the sea, a family of teenage brothers and sisters and older cousins fill the golden days with wine and games and planning a wedding. Enter the Goddens, irresistible, charming Kit and surly silent Hugo. Suddenly there's a serpent in paradise and the consequences will be devastating. And the first sentence, because we do like to do a first sentence, is this. Everyone talks about falling in love like it's the most miraculous, life-changing thing in the world. Um, uh, this was one of the books that I really wanted to put in my top five because I did really enjoy it. I thought it was beautifully written, very evocative. Um, at the start of the book sort of reminded me of family summer holidays um, and just that sort of time of coming together and with the heat and um, I thought it was lovely. It's, it goes on, things change and I would say it is a really good read um, but it's not my not one of my top five. But if you want something that just takes you away from the bad weather then I think I think you'd really enjoy it. I think it's a lovely book. The spine colour is beautiful as well. It goes from yellow to orange. Really like that. Less than 250 pages. Sorry for the noise me putting it on the floor. There you go. That we're down. Book one down. So the next one, Eight Pieces of Silver by Patrice Lawrence. Again, this was a strong contender to go in the top five. I really enjoyed it. Um, but there's quite a few really good books. So it, unfortunately it didn't. But it's still a great read. So... This is the blurb. Silver's door is open. My brain nudges me. She's not in there. All the time I've been hanging around and trying not to disturb her, she wasn't here at all. Bex and Silver live under the same roof, but they couldn't be less like sisters. Bex likes watching loud superhero movies, girls and chatting to anyone and everyone. Silver likes privacy. Her bedroom is her oasis and she has an unspoken rule that none of her family are allowed inside. But then Silver goes missing. Bex enters Silver's room and finds eight clues about Silver's secret life. Can Bex piece the jigsaw together and find her before it's too late? Um, I really enjoyed it. It was very interesting. It draws you in. It's good characters, good storyline, um, makes you think. Um, Patrice is an amazing author. I think she's excellent, consistently excellent. Um, and it's a it's a read that won't that won't disappoint. Um, Oh, here's the first sentence. Bex, Mum said, fix up. Don't complain, just fix up. We've been clearing up after you for 15 years. Again, I love these first sentences. It just gives such, um, such a sense of what the book might hold. But there we go. Down on the pile. Didn't make it to the top five, but very, very good. The next one confused me. So this is Wranglestone by Darren Charlton. Here's the blurb. Peter has never really felt at home in a place where practicality and grit are valued above all else. He's nothing like Cooper, the boy he's always watched from afar. But when he's ordered to join Cooper out on the mainland, they find more than just each other. There they unearth a, de a dark secret about Wranglestone's past, one that forces the pair to question everything they've ever known. Um, I enjoyed this book a lot in places, but I just felt for me, and it was the last book I read out of the 10, so I hold my hands up. It might have just been that it was I just almost had enough by then. Um, but I just felt there was too much in this book. There were too many changes. I loved the sort of setting and the tone that was taken. Um, 
Uh, uh, let, let's read this other sentence on the, on, it's not the blurb, but I think this just helps to signpost you to what sort of book it is. The islands of Lake Wranglestone are a safe haven in a world filled with the restless dead. But as the lake freezes over, there's nothing to stop them from crossing the ice. And it is, it, it's it's not a zombie book, but, you know, it's it's got that different element. And I really liked that, but it just kept, changing and changing and changing and I just couldn't keep fully uh, involved in the story I'm afraid but I thought it was really good um let's let's do the first line of the first chapter here we go Peter was born into a world of unwelcome visitors well there you go that says it all so Wranglestone Darren Charlton a good book just confusing for me drop that one but probably because um, it was the 10th book that I read. OK, here we go. Melt My Heart, Bethany Rutter. Mm, uh, this wasn't my favourite book. OK, here we go. Here's the here's the blurb. At the end of the summer, I'm going to university hundreds of miles away. I'm not ready. Not yet. But maybe I can be. Lily Rose's Summer of New Things. One, scoop ice cream with best friends Cassie. Two, hang out with people other than Cassie. Three, be romanced. Four, do not let twin sister know you are being romanced. Five, do not think about results day. Six, be more like Cassie. Seven, be less like Lily. Eight, who even is Lily? Um, it's a it's an interesting light book. And I think uh, what I love is it's very positive. It's gender positive, po um, body positive, um, all sorts of positive. It's, it's just a, it's a good book. Oh, my goodness. This is going to run out of battery. Hang on a sec. Gosh, never had that happen before where the computer was actually about to run out of battery. The battery is now charging. All is well. Uh, that would have been unfortunate if I recorded this whole thing and didn't realise that the computer had died, wouldn't it? That that really would be. Fortunately, that hasn't happened. So um, it, it's a good, positive, enjoyable book. Um, it, it just didn't it didn't hit me uh, and maybe because some of the other books have much more momentum to them or bigger subjects I don't know uh, it's it's a book that I'm sure people will enjoy reading let's find the first sentence the first sentence is this new things new things new things I chant in my head as my feet pound the pavement so it's written in a very approachable way um, and uh, yeah I there's nothing wrong with it but it wasn't for me, as enjoyable as some of the other books, which is a shame because I've enjoyed, was it Big Bones? No, it's no big deal that Bethany Rutt has written as well that I enjoyed. Anyway, there we go. That's that one, Dan. And then the last of the five that didn't make it, and I'm afraid my least favourite, unbelievably, is Loveless by Alice um, Osman. I, I think Alice is an amazing author. I love all her books, or I have up to now. And I didn't enjoy this, so I don't know why. I was just wanting more, and, and for me, it didn't deliver. OK, here's the blurb. Um, Georgia has never been in love, never kissed anyone, never even had a crush. But as a fanfic obsessed romantic, she's sure she'll find her person one day. As she starts university, Georgia makes a plan to find love. But when her actions wreak havoc among her friends, she questions why romance seems so easy for other people, yet not for her. With new terms thrown at her, asexual, aromantic, Georgia is more uncertain about her feelings than ever. Is she destined to remain loveless or has she been looking for the wrong thing all along? Um, so as I say, normally love her books. This just didn't do anything for me. Here's the first sentence. There were literally three separate couples sitting around the fire making out. Um, and I think maybe maybe I like a lot of YA books, but maybe ones about sort of young adults and dating. Maybe that just makes me feel a bit uncomfortable, a bit voyeuristic. I don't know. Uh, it's not um, it, reading those sort of books doesn't bring me a, a great joy. So maybe it's just that sort of subgenre I need to leave alone and park. So read them. Tell me what you think. Um, if you know other people that enjoy YA, see what they say. Let me know. Um, I'd be really keen to find out if it's me or, well, it probably, let's, let's face it, it is going to be me, isn't it? Anyway, let's move on because we've got five 
corkers and I'm bringing them to you. In fifth place, we have Cane Warriors by Alex Wheatle. And it didn't get fifth place just because it's under 200 pages. Um, it's, it's a good book. It's a great book. But I did want more. OK, here's the blurb. The only life Mur has ever known is toiling as a slave on the frontier sugarcane plantation for endless hot days, fearing the vicious whips of the overseers. Then one night he learns of an uprising led by the charismatic Taki. Mo is to be a cane warrior and fight for the freedom of all the enslaved people in the nearby plantations. But before they can escape, Mo and his friend Keverton must face their first great task to kill their overseer. Mr. Donaldson. Time is ticking and the day of the uprising approaches. Um, so I enjoyed absolutely everything about this, although, you know, saying you enjoy reading about very traumatic things is, is probably the wrong way to, to talk about it. It does very much feel like a novella to me because I just wanted more. I wanted it to carry on. I wanted the story to continue. Um, it sort of left me left me guessing, left me wanting more. Um, obviously a difficult subject, one that we should all know about and understand. Um, and here's the first, here's the first chapter. Sleep was hard to catch on this humid night. Mm, very good. So that is, that's number five. That's my fifth uh, sort of, so the uh, one of the runners up for the best um, YA book. Kane Warrior's Alex Wheatle. Very, very good. OK, now we come on to number four. And this is Good Girl, Bad Blood by Holly Jackson. Um, it's actually the follow on to A Good Girl's Guide to Murder that I haven't read. And I thought, well, shall I read A Good Girl's Guide to Murder first? And I thought, I can't read 11 books, let alone, you know, I just can't. So I thought, well, let's go with it and see if it stands on its, on its own. And it does. Clearly, if you've read the first book, there's a lot of... Um, continuity you, you there is quite a bit of benefit there uh, and I've heard some people say that they really loved the first book and were a bit disappointed with this one so I didn't have any I didn't carry any of that burden um, I thought it was really interesting I liked the different um, types of, of prose that you had in there so you had the, the normal fiction writing you had podcasts being released you had interviews done with people that um, were being interviewed for the podcast, but you got a lot more out of those interviews than might have then been edited for the podcast because this girl actually edits her podcast, unlike me, who seems incapable of doing such a thing, but never mind. Um, so, yeah, OK, here's the blurb. Pip Fitz Amobi is not a detective anymore. Her true crime podcast about the murder case she solved last year has gone viral, yet Pip insists her investigating days are behind her. But she will have to go back on her word when someone close to her goes missing and the police can't do anything about it. If they won't investigate, then Pip will, uncovering more of her town's dark secrets along the way. But will she find the answers before time runs out? Um, OK, where's the first sentence here? Oh, this is good. You'd think you'd know what a killer sounds like. Oh, that's very good, isn't it? Um, I There were times with this when I was just like, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And other times I thought, oh, is it as good? So it's lucky to have got position four um, in my in my top ten. Um, but it, I, I love crime books, so maybe it was just having that as well. But I thought it was, a, it was a good read and maybe I do need to go back now and read the first book. But actually, I am pretty sure I've I now know everything that happens in the first book. So I don't need to. So that's good. <laughs> right. We're getting through these. You've been very patient. We're now in third position. Beautiful book. And the stars were burning brightly. OK, listen to this. When 15-year-old Nathan discovers that his older brother Al has taken his own life, his whole world is torn apart. Al had so many dreams, so why did he do it? Convinced that his brother was in trouble, Nathan decides to retrace Al's footsteps. As he does, he meets Megan, Al's former classmate, who is determined as Nathan to keep Al's memory alive. Together they start seeking answers, but will either of them be able to handle the truth about Al's death when they eventually discover what happened. Um, uh, it's an extraordinary book. Let's, let's do the first sentence. When a star reaches the end of its lifetime, it explodes in this violent supernova. Um, and it is a book that is violent and, and explodes in, in many ways. Obviously, if, um, 
reading about suicide and the particular awful circumstances that might lead someone to consider that, then don't read this book. But um, personally, I, I didn't find it an upsetting read. I found it a read where I got all the sort of emotions. Yeah, sad, angry, angry at times, really angry um, for the conditions, the reasons why, the background. But I thought it was beautifully written, um, handled very capably and conscientiously. Um, good characters and done in a YA way. So it, it is lighter than maybe some of the, way, the ways I could have read this in, as an adult book. Um, I thought it was very good and very worth um, reading and very well deserving of being third place in my in my top 10. And the stars were burning brightly by Danielle uh, Yawando. Very, very good. So that's um, third. Second, this is a shock. I wasn't expecting to make this one second. But the second is Hold Back the Tide by Melinda Salisbury. Now, I had already got this book on my TBR shelves, my to be read shelves. Um, so when the top 10 were announced, I thought, oh, I've already got that book. There, there you go. But shall I tell you, I don't know why I've got this book. I don't know if it came in a book box. I don't know if, oh, well, I haven't been sent this one as a proof. I don't know if I'd read something amazing about it and got it on, on the back of that. I don't know, which is terrible. Um, but seeing as I have nearly <clears throat> 500 books on my to-be-read shelves. Oh, hang on, it's signed. It's signed by the author. So that must mean it was in a book box. There you go. Um, because I certainly haven't been to any author events uh, lately where I would be able to get it signed by uh, the author, Melinda Salisbury. So there we go. Uh, well, excellent. Here's the blurb. Everyone in Ormskalau knows what happened to Alva Douglas's mother all those years ago. It's why Alva can't wait to leave. But when dark forces begin to stir in the surrounding mountains, Alva has to face a very different future to the one she's been dreaming of and question everything she thought she knew about her past. Um, let's do the first sentence. Oh, here you go. Are you ready for this one? Here are the rules of living with a murderer. Oh, see, that's good. I thought it was a great book um, and it surprised me and it co consistently surprised me, um, which I which I don't always find, particularly in YA. Um, this woman can write. I will be following her. It's a it's an excellent book. I don't want to say too much about what it what well, I don't want to say what it's about. Um, there's action in it. There's. Um, it, it, well, yeah, I'm not I'm not saying I won't say I won't tell you. Read this book. Hold back the tide. Melinda Salisbury. I don't think you'd be disappointed. It's not your typical traditional story. So if you are someone who has to have it set out a, a particular way that you're used to. Fine. It might not be for you, but otherwise it's great. It challenges you and it's something different. And, and I will remember it. So there we go. There's that one. So we're at the final, the final, first place now, first place. And again, this is a surprise. I wasn't expecting this because I'd read another book by this author and hadn't enjoyed it that much. But this one is A Snowfall of Silver and it's by uh, Laura Wood. OK, here's the blurb. In the autumn of 1931, 18-year-old Freya runs away from her home in Cornwall to follow her dream of becoming an actress. When she finds work with a touring theatrical company, Freya thinks her path to success is clear. Amidst all the glamour and bustle of stage life, she discovers, for the first time, a place to belong. But can reality ever live up to her expectations? What if her life and falling in love turned out to be nothing like she planned? Um, let's find what's the first sentence oh, mm, mm, mm. oh yes this is this is great are you ready it is possible that the pantaloons were a mistake i love this book i love this character although it's written in the 1930s it reminded me in many ways of um a sort of evie epworth i've talked about this book a lot a lot the miseducation of evie epworth by Matson taylor but it did remind me there were there were moments of of Evie and Freya in this book being very similar this girl has left home 
in the first chapter and she's on the train to London and she's wearing pantaloons. And I just think it's lovely. She's um, a bright, strong, but not unrealistically strong, um, fun girl. The book made me smile. Um, it's it's a nice, easy read. Yeah, you, no serial killers in this. Um, nothing dystopian, nothing horror, nothing. It's just, it's lovely. Um, and they say a snow dusted love story. For me, it wasn't it wasn't about being a love story it, unless it's it's about Freya loving herself and and her character development. Then I could accept that. But I just thought it's, it's beautiful. It's lovely. It's a bit of fun, um, light, something different and uh, and well worth a read. So there we go. So my top three are And the Stars Were Burning Brightly by Danielle Yawando. Hold Back the Tide by Melinda Salisbury and The Snowfall of Silver by Laura Wood. And if I ever say to you again, I think I should read all the long list of books that are being put forward for a prize, please get a saucepan out, hit me over the head and tell me not to, because that, yes, that was just a step too far. I think I need sleep. I have given up on sleep in this week, but never mind. It's all good fun and uh, I won't forget it and I'll never do it again. <laughs> so, so there we are. It's all good. Anyway, enough about what I won't do again. What I would like to do again is try and write a book. Would Are you interested in that? I certainly am. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Faber seemed to be the place where people go to write books that do well. So I thought we should have a word with them. So we're going to talk to Nikki Clock, spelt C-L-O-K-E, because Nikki has her own books out as well. Uh, but we're going to talk to Nikki, who's um, one of the tutors at Faber, and uh, we're going to hear all about what happens. So Nikki, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for asking me. Well, we had to have the Faber Academy on. We absolutely had to because so many authors that I've interviewed have mentioned only one mentioned a different course. Every other author has mentioned the Faber course. And um, so my first question is, you know, can you write a rubbish book? And just because you go on a Faber book, it's suddenly a Faber course. It suddenly becomes this um, in incredible, brilliant book. Or are you selective as to who you take on? Um, I wish it was the former. <laughs> that would be great. That'd be a magic formula. Yeah. Um, I think it, it is slightly the latter. They are competitive courses. So so obviously when the, when those authors come to us, they're already really talented or have really great ideas. But um, but that's not to say that that we only select the, you know, the very, very best. Um, um, it's It's not necessarily about that. I think applying for the courses means that that those writers have committed to their writing and they are willing to invest that time, that money um, into, into those books. So that is quite a self-selecting group that, you know, that means they've got that determination and confidence and belief in themselves, which is so important for any writer. So I think that is the main thing really. Yeah. Fair enough. No, no magic ingredient, as you say. That's no. I mean, step. obviously, I think the course is wonderful. I think <laughs> our tutors are amazing. They're all very talented. But yes, the writers are doing as much work in that. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, when I first heard about Faber and I, and I looked at it, it seemed to be, and uh, this is going back in time, that you it was London based. You know, you had to again commit to being in in London for for a period of time. But obviously, that that's changed, and perhaps one of the benefits of of lockdown so you offer a variety of courses now I believe yeah so the very first courses in 2008-2009 um, were it just London based it was in Faber's the publishing houses offices um, but we have been running online courses for a while uh, so which is great obviously it means that people all around the world can can join us and it's also more flexible our online courses um, aren't necessarily held at a certain time each week so people can fit them in around their jobs or home commitments more easily um, but yes yeah, since lockdown obviously all the courses have gone online um, so we've massively expanded the range there which is it is great it's it's nice to feel that we're really accessible in that way now and it looks like you offer quite a variety from the very first dipping your toe in to the right let's get a book out of this yeah completely yeah there's one day courses and there's sort of six month ten month year long advanced courses and everything in between 
Um, fiction is is a big part of it, but we do memoir and poetry as well. So it's it's definitely expanding all the time. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh. It sounds very interesting. So when someone signs up for a course and it's online, um, are there live sessions as well? Or how, do, how does it work? Tell me a bit more. There's a mix. So yeah, it really depends on what people are looking for. Um, there are completely flexible ones which don't have a, a set time you need to be online. Um, no live element like that. But then there are others which do have kind of a weekly or monthly live meeting. You know, now that we're all so familiar with Zoom, it's much easier to do that mm. um so yeah it is a mix because everyone which is you know it's true for writers not on the courses everyone has to fit writing around their own particular circumstances don't they so mm. yeah, we, we try to offer that yeah so the course that you do where it is literally let let's get a, a book out of this okay. um there seems to be a, a considerable success with that um, i mean i'm not just saying it it's certainly from those that I talked to what do yeah. you would your experience back that up yeah so that's the six month writing a novel course which is it's kind of our flagship course it's the one we first started with um when the academy was just one person running it at Faber and that's a whole team but um that will that will generally be the one that most of the authors you've spoken to um have taken uh and yeah I think we're coming up to 140 publication deals um wow. from that course so so yeah, it does have a really good hit rate. Um, and and so, oh, it's, it's the best, one of the best things is to get that email from one of our students being like, I've just signed a deal. Like it's, it's so exciting because you've seen those novels from the application coming in over the six months. We're always keeping in touch with the groups and the tutors to see how people are getting on. And you see those writing samples, they're splitting to their group develop. So to see it go from that to being able to pick it up on a shelf is the most rewarding part of working at the Academy, I would say. And can you tell which ones might be a success pretty early on? Is, is there a certain, uh, I don't know, feeling about them? Yeah, I mean, I think you do. You do get a, you can sometimes, you'll see an application and think, oh, wow, I really, I really want to see this published because I want to read the whole novel. Obviously, we only get small samples when they're applying. Um, I can still remember. So I didn't work at the Academy when it first started. I was in a different department at Faber. But I can still remember the person who was running the academy at that point um, in 2009 coming in and saying, you've got to hear about this book's on the course. It's amazing. And that was before I go to sleep by S.J. Watson. Oh, and gosh. Yeah. As soon as anybody in the building picked that up, and this, you knew this is going to be big. Yeah. But then there's such a range of of writers who come onto the academy it's it's not all those kind of big block, blockbuster thrillers there's lots there's so much now there's so many different types of writers who are coming through and so it's really interesting now to see you know what's gonna what's gonna take off and and yeah does the course have quite a standing then with agents and publishers you know someone says well i've done this book and and i did it through the favor course does that sort of lift them higher up the the, the list yeah, I think it does. It does um, get an agent's attention, partly because of the course reputation. But again, it, as I said before, it, it, it does say something about the writer. It, it says, I, I believe in myself and I've invested this time in making my novel the best I think it can be. So, of course, that makes them think, OK, that's interesting. Let me let me see mm. what they've been doing. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's a combination, but it definitely does help. We send out an anthology of our students' work, the students on the six month course, we sent an anthology to agents um, oh. for them to have a sneak peek basically at what the students have been working on. So some students find their agents that way, others go on to submit more widely or later on in their journey if they're working on a different novel later on. Um, and then I'll mention the academy that way. Right, so it's not just you deliver the course and that's it, there are added components to it. You you are focused on moving them on and, and getting that book published. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is because we're a publishing house um, and we have that industry knowledge, the writing is the most important part. And that is, I would say to any student, come on the course, focus on your writing. Don't think about the next step. The best, the most important thing that you can leave the course with is feeling confident that you can write this to the best of your ability and make it the story you want it to be. But at the same time, we are, we do have that industry knowledge and kind of market expertise that we want to pass on if a student is coming to the course because they want to pursue a career as an author we want to arm them with the 
the knowledge that they need to do that and it's not the case for everybody some people do just want to come and, and write the story that's been in their head for so long not everybody wants to, to go on and be a top 10 bestseller um but yeah we want to be able to advise them and, and give and pass on that that information because it is it's such a confusing and complicated industry for people outside of it I think it's we want to shine a light and kind of dispel some of the myths about about how you get a deal and how you find agents and make it less scary like I think that's that's so important to us we've just had um, a guest session on one of the online courses where um, one of our editors did a, a guest talk for the students on that course and lots of feedback was oh wow I feel I feel so much so less intimidated now by the industry and I you know it seems so much more open to me now and that's so important to us that it doesn't feel like publishers are these scary gatekeepers it's it's kind of about us opening those gates and saying this is how the industry works this is what you need to send to an agent and and this is what an agent will do for you and this is what self-publishing looks like and and kind of making that more friendly I think is really important yeah. to us and for people to start that six month course in particular they do have to have a, a book in mind or have um, at least some experience it's not a case that they just click on apply there they do need to put forward their case for you to consider yeah so they have to write a covering letter um, which includes a bit about the idea they want to work on as well as a sample of their writing they don't have to have started the novel itself the writing sample can be something else but they do need to have an idea because the first weeks of that course are about shaping your idea but you can't come from and start from scratch. You kind of, you need to have something um, that we think will, will, will get you through the six months. Um, obviously with the caveat that lots of ideas change and grow over that time as you learn more about the process. Um, but yeah, that's definitely part of it. The other really important part about the application as well as the writing and the idea is just what kind of um, group member you'll be because so much of those courses the success depends on the group being a really warm, supportive, enthusiastic group of people who want to work together and who aren't just turning up because they want to write a bestseller. They, you know, they want to spend the six months learning and supporting each other and, may, and hopefully leave it with a writing group they can keep for a long time. Um, so we are looking for that. We're looking to see, are you going to be the kind of person who's really invested in giving good feedback as well as receiving it um, during the course. So that's that's another important thing in the application. And presumably giving others feedback actually helps you develop yourself as well. It's another it's another skill. But how does that work in terms of the the group dynamics when it's online? Can you can you still get that? Yeah, I think it depends. Um, so, so some of them will be done on Zoom. As, as they do it in the classroom other times it's written feedback on a forum but it's really important for the tutors always to be monitoring that and, and explaining what good feedback looks like um it's yeah. not necessarily pointing out someone's spelling mistakes it's you know it has to be bigger more constructive things um i mean i've just finished a course uh, myself i've been learning how to write for tv which is something that i've not done before and it was really good for me actually i think to remember what it's like to be a student and and how daunting that experience of putting your work out there and getting that feedback back um but it is it is as you say such a valuable skill to learn mm. to give that feedback and to hone your editorial eye it's it's so important for your own work going forward and how much time do people need to commit because okay some people listening to this might have the time to to devote full days every day of every week um, but other people, families, work, whatever, life commitments, how much time of, of their lives do you need them to give to make this course a success? I think it, we usually say between and four, five and seven hours a week is, is, mm. is good. Um, that involves reading other people's work who are getting feedback that week, as well as, as you're working on your own writing. I think also like everyone's journey is different. And some people will come onto one of those courses and think, I want to finish this course with a with a full draft and that's fine that's great um to to really compact that writing time and think i'm going to power through it here other people it's that's not feasible or it's not how they work they don't you know they don't write best like that so some people will finish the course with all that knowledge ready and then spend another a year two years working on their novel mm -hmm. and getting into the shape and that's fine like it, it it's not a race i think um it's it's you know spending the time to do the reading during the course is important and writing where you can and 
in a way that suits you best is important too. But yeah, I think everyone everyone will have different time scales involved. It must be hard for those authors that have done the course, done really well, got a book out of it, sold well, and then they have to go to their second book and you haven't got all the support that you had. Can they come back on? And I was thinking, do they just come back on and do another course each time to help? Yeah, people have done that. Um, but I think it does, it is true that people uh, stay in touch with their classes. You know, I know some of the groups who, who did the course in 2009 who still meet up and share work because they've got so used to and so good at giving that feedback and trusting each other and and understanding what each other's writing goals are that that's the perfect support group for them and some of them will have gone on to publish multiple books others will still be working on the debut but they still have that really nice bond where they're sharing work so that happens sometimes and that's always really lovely to hear um, and what if what if you're someone like me who's great at coming up with the ideas for books but not so good at progressing that any further do you have a course on the you know getting through all these ideas and coming up with something that you can focus on if we did I would be on it all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah we do have a course called finish your draft which I think is exactly for that um we have an advanced fiction workshop which is more like a a writing group um with a tutor leading you but more about getting that work finished um once you've sort of got the idea in place so yeah we do have those um, and that's an important skill to learn as well <laughs> yes so if someone's dreamt of writing a book and, and hasn't actually done that yet at what point do they should they go on one of the courses should they just do the short courses straight away and, and see if it's for them or or how do you suggest they approach it yeah I mean I think it's worth taking a look at the different courses and seeing you know what appeals not you know some people really enjoy building those courses up so starting with a beginner's one and then moving on um, as their idea progresses we have like several online courses that are designed to do that so we have one called kickstart your novel so that's before writing a novel and then writing novels the long one finish your draft comes after that so some people do really enjoy that natural building block but obviously not everybody has has the time or the resources to commit mm. to doing multiple courses so I think it's worth thinking about whether you feel you need the basics of fiction in place yeah. before you start writing or whether you want to have a go at first and then come to us at a later stage to really hone those ideas and polish them I think yeah it, it really depends um, but there should be something for everybody we ha also have our mentoring and manuscript assessment programs which are slightly different um mm. so manuscript assessment is we have professional reports on people's um part finished novels or finished novels or when they're ready to submit to an agent so that's another thing to consider instead of a course so here's a, here's a question. What's what's more important, do you think, for, for someone starting on their writing career to have the idea, the hook, or is it having the writing technique and the sort of dedication? What What's more important, would you say? Oh, that is so tricky. And I think it's a question I ask myself as a writer all the time, because obviously that's all you hear is people want the hook. You know, editors want the hook. Um, and I think it can be difficult to retrofit a hook into into a, into a novel. Um, yeah. But at the same time, not all novels have to have a massive hook. You know, some people, some novels are brilliant for the reading experience. You know, you want to sit down and, and absorb yourself in that writing. So I think we have, as an industry, become a little bit too obsessed with this idea of it has to have this one line pitch and this hook. Um, and I don't think that is true. Are there other courses that you that Faber do that aren't just about um, writing a novel? Is there, I don't know, poetry or is it what else is there? Yeah, we've got quite a few poetry courses actually. So Faber was is was and is a really big poetry publisher. So that's a really important part of our heritage. Um, the head of Faber Academy is also a published poet, so it's definitely something that he cares a lot about. Yeah. Um, it's kind of we're divided in the office between poetry and prose fans it's a bit of an ongoing battle um so yeah so with poetry it's the same as with fiction we have one day beginner courses right up to an advanced um writing your first collection um course so yeah it's definitely the whole other branch um we have memoir courses too um we're just about to launch a short um audio drama course so writing like radio plays and audible originals wow. so i'm excited about that yeah, yeah. That sounds really interesting because that's such a thing of this time, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I might actually take that one myself if they'll let me. 
wonderful so because of lockdown are you finding more people are doing courses are people making the most of being stuck at home definitely and it, I find that incredibly inspiring because I think in the last year I've written less than I have in the previous 10 like I just haven't been able to focus on anything so anyone who has managed to get a novel written in 2020 deserves all of the accolades I think um but yes we definitely have seen a lot more people coming on to on to courses or submitting finished novels for an assessment um which I think is brilliant and I think partly it's people are much more confident with online learning at the moment because we've all spent so much time on zoom and um, yeah, people so feel true. more familiar with it but I think also it's it's just this partly people think wow this is now the time to do this thing I've been wanting to do there's no more putting off mm. things we care about which I think is great um but also just that connection of being in, in a group or having people to talk to who aren't your colleagues or your family when we're in lockdown is yeah it's really nice and presumably it's not all people that have been writing um by themselves for 30 years and coming with flouncy scarves on and are <laughs> know everything presumably there are other sort of people there yes there's yeah definitely definitely there's people who who've never written a word of fiction before and decided they want to or yeah people who've been experimenting by themselves for a long time and, and everything in between yeah Gosh, I think I'm going to stop this conversation and sign off immediately. <laughs> um, You're welcome anytime. Wonderful. Um, yeah, such an opportunity. And, and as I say, so many authors have been on the courses so that it, it stands up. It, you know, the, the, the Faber name is so well known and regarded. Yeah. And I think what's really lovely about that is, is all those alumni who have gone on to do amazing things, um, like Leslie, Cara um, and Erica, who you've just spoken to, it's, it, is they do they speak so fondly of, of the academy and their time with us and that's obviously really lovely for us to hear but I think it's also a testament to their groups and to mm. and to the kind of community that has been built if that doesn't sound too cheesy but the teaching is a really important great part of it but it does feel like we are building this this community of writers who are who are supporting each other um which is really special and as you say those friendships and those connections go on yeah uh, uh, after the course is over well my goodness Nikki I just appreciate your time um I'm I'm off to have a look so yes I should say if somebody's interested in finding out more and looking at the courses and what's involved um they would go online to the website yep so faberacademy.co.uk um or just drop us a line at academy at faber.co.uk and we're always happy to talk you through the options well that's brilliant as I say I'm I'm off to look now, but Nikki, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. It's lovely to talk to you. Gosh, well, that was very interesting. I feel inspired. I need to go off and sign up for every possible course. Um, and uh, yeah, they've got so many different courses. Anyway, I better stop. I've taken up enough of your time. Look, we have a very interesting and unique book and author situation to talk about next week um we're going to interview them to hear more about what what's happened and what's going on because it it really is quite compelling so we're going to be we're going to be doing that i'm going to be waffling on about more books waffling on about what else i've done in my life that's embarrassing and how much coffee and chocolate i've drunk or eaten so there we go um you look after yourselves and i'll see you very soon take care now bye bye you've been listening to the quick book reviews podcast that's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon. <laughs>